So it's always about relationships and it's always about delivering value to your investors and the investors need to see it, right? So it's always selling yourself, always telling who you are, always telling your story, always making it, you know, investor centric. That's what makes the difference and will make somebody successful. Whereas if it's all about, you know, just money and just the returns at the end of the day, there are other people doing other deals. There's a lot of people doing syndications right now. So there are choices on who these people go with and you got to give them a good reason to go with you or nobody's going to go with you. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Sam Rust. Joining us today is Tilden Muschietti, who is the managing partner of Muschietti Syndication Law Group, a boutique syndication law firm serving both small and growth bound syndicators, as well as private equity firms. Tilden is also a real estate syndicator himself and has been general counsel on several real estate private equity funds. He works with his clients' ambitions and overall vision to help them close the current deal and fill in that, quote, missing piece, whatever is needed to keep adding more syndicated partnerships to their portfolios. Tilden, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much, Sam. I'm really happy to be here. So Tilden, you got into law, you got your law degree back in 2003. Did you always know you wanted to head down the path of securities and real estate and kind of the overlay or intersection of those two? What drew you to that specialty? Yeah, close. I went to law school thinking I was going to be a developer. So Mm -hmm. I looked around and a lot of the really successful developers were attorneys. And so I thought, okay, well, this would be a good way for me to not only get money, but also be able to handle the legal aspects of a project. Got into law school and loved property and all the subjects that revolved around that, securities, corporations. And then I took a litigation course And that kind of led me astray for a little while because after law school, I started litigating. So I was a real estate litigator for a lot of years or really anything that touched with real estate. And it was just not the most happy of worlds, right? In litigation, you're always trying to attack the other side. You're not developing anything. You're always just tearing stuff down. So I realized that I was kind of missing my calling and was looking around. And that's when a partner approached me about syndication. What was your first thought? I mean, you obviously had some exposure to it probably in your real estate courses. Syndication is not necessarily a new idea, but what flipped the switch for you of going, hey, I want to stop tearing down as it were, and I want to go start building stuff and helping people build businesses around this model. It was really, I had done a lot of finance courses. I got my CCIM a while back, maybe eight, 10 years ago. I loved that aspect of it. And I started just looking at all the deals my clients were doing. And when my partner approached me about it and showed me the deal, it was was just a small triple net deal in the South. It had great numbers because it was coming in cheap. And I thought, well, you know, there's nothing that these other syndicators don't know that I don't know. So why I just don't have the experience yet. So why don't we give it a try and let's see what happens. And so we did. And it was really successful and actually quite a bit more fun than uh, than deposing people or things like that. Yeah. Where was your first project and roughly when did you guys get into that? It was in Alabama and I got into it in about 2013, 2014, something oh, like wow. that. Okay. Yeah. So you were early, at least for a lot of the retail syndicators that have popped up yeah. since then. That's You rode a good wave over the last nine years. Yeah. We've been successful, made good money for my clients and my investors and good money for us. Yeah. Well, that's the, the magic elixir all the way around. In your intro, you talk about working with clients' ambitions and overall vision to fill in that missing piece, whatever it is. Yeah. When you're working with clients who are syndicating deals, What often is that missing piece? There's a couple of big ones that I can think of off the top of my head, but I'm curious, what do you see most often as that missing piece? Most of the time, it's a lack of focus. So people come into the real estate thinking that they're going to syndicate, wanting to, most of them are drawn by the money and sort of the chutzpah to get it done. What they're missing is kind of a guiding principle. And so principle of what they're, why they're investing in this or why an investor should trust them. And it's sort of that vision statement or that, you know, motivational statement that a lot of syndicators are missing at the very, as they first start, that is the difference between really being successful and not. 
you know, I could find a deal. I could go on on one of the exchanges and find a property right now and put it in front of clients and or in front of potential investors. But unless I've got a good story to tell about it, they're just not going to invest with. It. So what I help them do most of the time is if they don't have that kind of idea of what the direction is, is we talk about, well, where's this going? What's the next deal and the next deal and the next deal? Where are your fees in line? What sort of returns are you looking at? All those kinds of things that investors care about and are looking for. We wrap it all up in something that I call the founder investment theory, which is that the theory of why to invest in this or why to trust this syndicator on why an investor should invest with them. Yeah, I think that bigger why, that's one of the phrases that we hear a fair amount. Sure. It is really important because like you said, I mean, humans are hardwired to enjoy stories, to communicate in story, to resonate with the emotion of a story. And especially when you're starting out in this business, it's, I tell people often real estate syndication is not necessarily hard, but building a business in it is hard. So a one-off topic, yeah. you know, maybe you can do that, but building a business that will carry on into the future and, and have an awesome basket of assets. That's pretty challenging. And it takes dimension in who you are and the story that you're trying to sell. Is there any story, uh, you know, you could be anonymous or not, but of someone who added an interesting dimension to their story as a result of talking to you and kind of really driving in on the why? Yeah, a lot of my uh, clients come from diverse backgrounds and from different parts, but they all have real estate at its heart. If I had to come up with a story, I would probably talk about, well, I'd talk about two. So probably one of the most successful regular syndicators I know was an appraiser. And he got his first deal by just, you know, he had seen a ton of big, big commercial real estate deals. One came across his lap. He called everybody he knew, syndicated that deal. And the set by the time he did his second deal, it was now a matter of sending out an email and it's funded within an hour. And these are big deals he's doing. The last one he did was over 150 million. So they're not tiny projects by any means, but he's always stuck with that for him. It's value add, value add, value add. That's all he does. For others, it's coming up with a creative way to reimagine things, whether it's repositioning an asset from multifamily to some other use or to multifamily from a hotel or things like that is a creative way to do it. And it, it's that, that little spark that gets an investor's attention that makes the difference. It explains the ROI, it explains their fees of why go with this investor. And it really kind of sets them apart from all the other people. Yeah. I was talking to a, a guy who's been in more of the institutional world, you know, and led the acquisition of a multi-billion dollar portfolio. But he said in the retail market, their model was going and get institutional capital for 90%, but then they had to still syndicate about 10%. He said in real estate, generally for the retail investor, there's two types of investors. There's the folks who want the biggest, highest return possible, right? They're mm -hmm. elephant hunting on the savanna. And then there's another fairly significant sector of folks that are all about capital preservation. They want to yep. get into low risk investments. I'm curious, have you seen that in your career to broadly be true? And how, in your experience, would you assign the percentages between those two groups of investors, at least the ones that you sure. So yeah, that's part of what I think of as founder investment theory too. So I think it's that spectrum of risk that every investor is looking at. And you need to be consistent with that where you're at on that spectrum. So I'd say the capital preservation, uh, so there I have a story too. So I was going for this first deal and I was meeting a doctor that I knew and it was asking him for an investment and our IRR was going to probably land somewhere around 15%. So I showed him the deal and he said, wow, that looks like a really great deal. And I thought I was done. I was like, great. All right. He's going to give me like 400000 This is going to be terrific. And I said, perfect. So how much are you in for? And he said, well, I'm not going to invest in it. I'm like, but you just, <laughs> you just said it was a great deal. Why won't you invest in it? And he's like, no, you, you don't get it. So you got a 15% return, but that's not what I'm looking for. When I do a, an investment like this, I'm looking for, I'm just using my mess around money. I'm just using money that, you know, I'll hit a few grand slams, but mostly I'm looking to have fun. I don't want a 15% return. This looks like a pretty normal, safe return to me. There's nothing exciting about it. And that really kind of opened my eyes to that idea of that spectrum. 
So I think on that low end, you have, you know, somewhere around 10% to maybe 13% as your very, very safe you know, very nice, typical things. It should not be a development project because a development project should be getting more. It should be something like a triple net or a, just a capital appreciation project in multifamily in a major city. I mean, that's what those people tend to be looking for. In that middle sector where I tend to be is that 13% to maybe 18, 19%. And that's where I play the most. And that is your normal investors. They're looking for a good return, but they're also looking for something that's reasonably safe. And then you've got your people who are swinging for the fences. And to me, that's probably in the you know, 20% and above range. Now, if you're in a tertiary city developing in the middle of nowhere, something you know kind of crazy, you better have you know, 40, 50, 60%, you know, big, big numbers. If it's, you know, you're just developing a multifamily project in a pretty good area, it's probably going to be closer to 20 to 30%. So I see it kind of on that spectrum. And so you need to target your theory with what your investors are expecting too. Because if they're swinging for the fences all the time, don't bother pitching them at all on those safe assets and vice versa. Yeah. So essentially that doctor said, this isn't exciting enough for me. I want something yep. that the risk reward is a uh, variance is higher, essentially. Yep, absolutely. Now, you did come in on a later project I did that was a big development project and did invest a good amount of money. So it just was that deal wasn't what he was looking for. It didn't mesh with what his his own personal looks were. Yeah. How have you structured your development deals for your limited partners? We've done some development or we're in the midst of doing, we're closing on our, or we're the final CEO on our first development is going to be issued here in like two weeks. And what we did was the standard 70-30 with a pref, but in the 18 months while we had investor capital and we're building this project, um, we gave a, a 10% coupon essentially that will accumulate it and will be paid out of future cash flow slash refinances. How have you kind of tried to bridge that gap? Because there's usually an 18 months to 24 month period where there is no cash flow. Obviously, it's a yeah. high risk investment. The first step to getting a successful development is making sure you're in the 20s, at least in my opinion, mm -hmm. in our perspective. Yep. But just curious, how have you attracted investors to those types of projects? Get as high of an IRR as possible. So know your levers which trigger that. So I kind of start backwards. I advise my clients to start backwards too, is to know your client and know what kind of returns they're looking for, and then underwrite deals to that. And so if I'm doing an 8% PREF with a 70-30 split, something like that, I'll draw it out on paper first and see, okay, is this lining up? Am I making money on it, right? First, the syndicator has to make money or there's no reason to do it. And, you know, where are my investors going to get it? And what kind of return are they getting with that? If they're getting a 25% return with something like that, great. Okay, I know I'm in the ballpark. If they're getting a 40% return, maybe I have more room to take more money for myself. And if they're getting a 15% return, I probably need to get put back more into the system. So I kind of work my way to the middle with the middle being what my investors are expecting. It's a... Uh always trying to balance that risk reward profile. And yeah. as you're in the business, obviously the network grows and you're going to get people across the spectrum. And that's why one of the things that we did recently was we did a, a fund with some development in it and some value add, kind of bridging yep. both those worlds, giving you a little bit of upside, but also raising the floor a little bit as you've got multiple. Yeah. And I have clients that do exactly that and it's great. So if they're doing a fund, it's, it's you know, we're doing... 20% swing for the fences, and then 40%, 40%, 40%, you know, the middle of the road, and then 40% super safe, something like that. And they're very successful because if they miss for the fences, they're still giving their investors returns, which keeps their investors happy still. You talk a fair amount on your website in a couple of blog posts about uh, selling yourself first as a syndicator. Yep. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, investors are choosing to go with the syndicator. So I was on a call with a with a potential client, I think just yesterday. And what my advice is, is this is still a relationship business. It's all well and good to think that you can just put some ads up on the internet and find investors and never have to talk to them and the money's going to come flowing in. And if that works, fantastic, you solved the puzzle, but I've never heard of it working. I've heard of a lot of people trying that. So it's always about 
relationships. And it's always about delivering value to your investors. And the investors need to see it, right? So it's always selling yourself, always telling who you are, always telling your story, always making it, you know, investor centric. That's what makes the difference and will make somebody successful. Whereas if it's all about, you know, just money and just the returns at the end of the day, there are other people doing other deals. There's a lot of people doing syndications right now. So there are choices on who these people go with and you got to give them a good reason to go with you or nobody's going to go with you. Yeah. No, that's something that we've talked about often internally is how do you both sell yourself in an attractive way, differentiate yourself might be another way to say it, but also yeah. be authentic in that. Like we're evaluating our go-to-market strategy right now. We traditionally have done a little bit of development with primarily value add but we've been generally priced out of the market for the mm -hmm. last 12 months. It's been yeah, a it's really <laughs> difficult environment to buy in if you're targeting that 13 to 19% spread, right? Yeah. And so just you, know, you can either change your assumptions and get more aggressive, or you can sit on the sideline, or you can go after a lower cost of capital and change your business model. And the, those are the types of things that we're wrestling through and just fundamentally not willing to change the way that we do our underwriting because Right. For who we are as a conservative nature, I want to be able to sleep at night. You know, I get that question. Exactly. Or not. How do you sleep at night with all this money that you've raised <laughs> and you're stewarding? And blah, 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 blah. Exactly. Well, it's because we've gone backwards and forwards and we're highly confident in our underwriting, not just you know, because it's not some random person investing in our deal. It's, it's my dad or it's you know, longtime exactly. friends. And you just look at things differently. And I don't want to lose that aspect. So I think that, yes, selling yourself, but also being true to yourself. In Absolutely. What you're trying to accomplish because investors will pick up on that. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a BS meter, and usually folks with money have a decent one. It's not always yeah. true, of course, or you wouldn't have hucksters <laughs> all over the place. But in our but they world, won't stay that wealthy for long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. What is it? A fool and his money are soon parted. But that's not who our traditional investors are. Our investors are usually right. pretty thoughtful people, working professionals that have a good sense of people. And so you don't want to put on an act just to raise money. It likely will not work. Yeah, I've told a lot of people before, if you're not in this for the investor, and if you're not willing to think of them first, you might as well not be doing this business. Because if you're not acting conservatively, and you're just making numbers up and kind of winging it, you're going to lose people's money, and you're going to have a very short business. Whereas if you just do it right, and just do the right thing, and just be as truthful and honest, and, you know, check your numbers and, you know, take their money more seriously than they do, you'll always have repeat investors. They'll always keep coming back. Yeah. From a, a national market perspective, you have an office, a law office in the LA area. You have another mm -hmm. office over in Raleigh. Your first deal was yep. in Alabama. You have visibility into a lot of different markets. Is there yeah. any macro trends that you see developing now that you find interesting or informing your investment strategy? So certainly the rise of secondary markets is very prevalent. Here in Raleigh, we have an amazing market. Austin is, you know, traditionally is a secondary market and is currently still the number one growing market in the nation, followed by Raleigh. And that's interesting to me that the primary markets people are leaving and coming to these secondary and even tertiary markets. I get a lot of calls with some really interesting deals from people in those secondary and tertiary markets. So that's exciting. Multifamily has always been popular and probably always will be popular, but we're getting more kind of creative ways to get into multifamily with whether it's repositioning of hotels or, you know, ground up construction with some sort of something special about it, like whether it's eventually condoizing it or things like that. That's a new way of people are of getting into multifamily in an exciting way. Office and retail are challenging places right now, which isn't surprising, but retail's coming back pretty strong uh, as long as it's not a mall. Then, you know, so now it's really, can we think of good uses for mall space? Those are kind of the bigger trends that I'm seeing. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense and, and reflects a lot of what we're seeing as well. It, it has been interesting to watch retail do pretty well over the last yeah. year or so as an asset class. But man, there's some deals in the office space and, and I put deals in air quotes. Yeah. You know, on a historical basis, it's amazing. But I think we still are, are working through what's the new normal after COVID. Yeah, um, no one knows. Unless you're in a newer building in a big city center, man, I just wouldn't touch office with a 10-foot pole right now. 
<laughs> yeah, and even then, I'm not sure I would touch something even in city center. It would have to have some sort of, you know, there'd be basically no office in the area. And then then that would be compelling. And I like the executive suite model a lot. There's a lot of money that can be made in that. And I've done syndications where we've used executive suites as kind of the way to make more returns for investors. And that seems to work pretty well. Medical offices is generally pretty good, but the cost of getting medical office or converting to medical office is really expensive right now. So I wouldn't really do that at this point because it's just, it's still way too expensive. Yeah, but, tenant yeah. improvements in that space. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Huge. So that's something to keep an eye on. You know, as we're winding down here, you're an attorney. You're on the, yep. you're obviously familiar with securities law, real estate law. There's some folks, some syndicators that will split those roles, right? They'll have a different attorney for their securities and a different for their real estate law. Mm -hmm. Where do you come down on that? Obviously, I assume you're going to have some sort of a bias answering that question. I I do. I'm inviting you to share your bias, advocate for your bias, (laughs) convert us here. Sure. Maybe it's self-serving, but I think it's split. I've been a real estate attorney. I've practiced as a real estate attorney. I've done leases. I've done purchase and sales. I've I've litigated. And- when you're doing that, you're getting one specific mindset that is very important for that role, but it's also very different thinking that goes on when we're talking about securities. When we're talking about securities, I'm always thinking about, okay, how do I protect investors? Or how do I make sure that my syndicator is talking to investors in a way that will protect them ultimately by conveying the right information to their investors. And they're just two very different worlds. So I don't even try and play in both at this point. It's uh, I only do securities and I work with a lot of real estate attorneys. And for the most part, they refer to me and don't try and do it themselves. The securities work just because I wouldn't be the best real estate attorney right now for them. And they're not going to be the best securities attorney. Yeah, that makes sense. What's one habit that's contributed most to your success? Oh, good question. Just absolute fundamental commitment to my investors. I will lose money or my clients. I will lose money myself over them losing money. So that way, you know, I'm walking the talk that I'm doing and it shows that, you know, I'm committed to them. So I think that's the most successful thing anybody could ever do. Yeah. Well, Tilden, really appreciate you joining the show today. If folks want to reach out, learn more about securities law and the services that you can offer, where can they reach out to you? So our website is www.muschettilaw, and that's M-O-S-C-H-E-T-T-I law.com. Or they can send me an email directly. And if they have a couple of questions, feel free to send me an email and see if I can answer them. And if not, I'll at least get back to you a with where to go if I'm not the right person. And so they can just email me to info, I-N-F-O, at muschettilaw.com. Fantastic. Well, thank you to our listeners for joining us, Tilden and I, on another episode of the Real Estate Syndication Show. This is your host, Sam Rust, signing off. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope you have liked and subscribed to the show. Please tell your friends about the Real Estate Syndication Show. And I hope that you are learning and growing. Don't forget to go to lifebridgecapital.com where you can start investing today.